when the volumes of freedom first began to be published, I think one of the most uh, prominent initial reactions was simple astonishment at the number of documents uh, written or authored directly by slaves and ex-slaves that we had uncovered. And these included not only uh, letters written by the literate minority, but direct testimony in other forms, affidavits, testimony before Freedmen's Bureau courts, courts martial, military commissions. Um, people had really not, historians had really not imagined how voluminous the record, the documentary record was. And so our first big impact was to show the availability of these sources and many, many scholars subsequently have now begun to mine the same sources. Another major impact was the way we were able to show through this rich documentation the enormous variety of the process of emancipation, that it was different for people who were in areas occupied by Union troops or held consistently within the Confederacy. It was different for men than it was for women, than it was for elderly people, than it was for children. And subsequent scholarship has picked up on that uh, documentation to begin to explore much more fully the geographical and chronological variations in emancipation. Uh, finally, and probably most significant, I think, was the way our volume showed that emancipation was a process in which slaves and ex-slaves themselves played an enormous role. Um, this, this, of course, was an assertion that scholars like W.B. Du Bois had made many years ago, but was not able to fully document. Our volume showed that in day in, day out ways, in a myriad of ways, slaves and ex-slaves contributed to the destruction of slavery. And I think that's had a huge impact on the historiography. Today, no self-respecting historian would not take into account the role that slaves themselves played in destroying slavery. So I would point to that as the biggest impact, identifying the participation of slaves and ex-slaves in what's one of the greatest dramas of American history. ColorConventions.org changes so much of what we thought we knew about early black leg organizing and 19th century race and reform. To assemble the scattered archives, CCP includes teaching partners and community members from across North America in gathering records and in creating research exhibits mirroring the collective energy and distributed nature of the conventions themselves. This was a mass movement. Together we have found hundreds and hundreds of conventions through proceedings, records, coverage. And we know that tens of thousands of delegates came from across the United States and from across Canada, helping us to understand just how much this is a story that's never really been fully told. We know that it's been misunderstood as a subset of abolition, but the collection that we're building helps to show just how expansive and vibrant this landscape really was. Generations of scholars and community members will be drawing from this archive and from the interpretive apparatus that appears on colorconventions.org. And bringing these records together in one place underscores that black freedom movements was always about more than anti-slavery. It's about educational access and justice. It's about voting rights and legal rights. It's about the safety for black communities from state sanctioned violence. This online repository allows us to ask questions that move well beyond abolition and anti-slavery and affirms the centrality of black life and black activism and organizing in the ways in which it informs current movements. This archive will open up avenues of interrogation, not only for scholars for generations to come, but also for communities who are asking serious questions about the long history of civil rights activism in North America. Since the publication of Volume 1 in 1992, the Martin Luther King Jr. Papers Project has helped advance new areas of study on King and the African American freedom struggle. Published in 2007, Volume 6 presents King's never-before-published sermon file found in the basement of Mrs. King's home in 1997. The most significant finding 
was a cardboard box that held more than 200 folders containing documents King used to prepare his sermons. This private collection sheds light on King's theological evolution and preaching preparation of one of the most noted orators of the modern era. All volumes chronicle King's forgotten legacy as a pastor, prophet, theologian, scholar, preacher, and family man. The Kentucky Historical Society needed to launch the Civil War Governors of Kentucky Digital Documentary Edition to enable a more inclusive historiography of the Border South. Before the project began, historians could not thoroughly explore the lived experience of community conflict, governmental collapse, and emancipation with the collections accessible at university research archives. Existing manuscript holdings and institutional collecting priorities had been intentionally shaped in the first half of the 20th century to advance flattering narratives of elite Confederate families. We had too few voices to tell the stories we needed to tell. Rather than dry administrative records, Civil War Governors presents a vibrant body of text from tens of thousands of new historical perspectives. Together, they document the seismic social, economic, and political changes wrought by a national conflict in the voices of women, the enslaved, the landless, and refugees who experienced a modern war in their families, homes, and communities.